Hi everyone and welcome to The Raw Show with Michael McDonnell. I have a very special guest. We have Tim Matthews joining me today. Tim, thank you for being on the show. Yeah, cheers man. It's an absolute honour and a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to see where this goes. <laughs> me too. <laughs> Tim is the founder of The Powerful Man. He's a men's empowerment coach, speaker and soon to be author. He is the creator of the activation method and he's a master at helping men to unleash themselves from the patterns of self-sabotage to discover how powerful they really are so they can take their life and business to the next level free from stress, struggle and sacrifice. So it seems we've got a lot of avenues that we can dive in but I thought we would, <laughs> I thought we'd start with, with your background really. So would you be able to share with me and our listeners where you were born and what it was like for you growing up? Yeah, nice man, with pleasure. Um, so for me, I was born in Leeds in the UK so obviously uh, about maybe two hours from, from Liverpool, although I know you're not from Liverpool Mike but still just, just over the way a bit yep. closer than some of the guys that might be listening in the US or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. What was it like for me growing up? Um, <clears throat> interesting, yeah, an interesting one. Um, I grew up in a in a house. Although my you know my parents were amazing parents, you know they did uh, they did the best they could with what they knew how to do. Um, and I grew up in a household whereby it was very much. It was very authoritarian, you know, you will see your father and wait till your father comes home and all that kind of stuff. That was more when I was a, a younger a younger boy, if you like. Um, I really felt like a lot of the time is that um, like I was walking on eggshells a lot of the time. Um, like I couldn't really be me. I couldn't really speak my own voice. I couldn't really... Um, I just didn't know how to express myself in the world you know I formed the belief that you know to get by um, it was easier for me to just go under the radar uh, people mm. please self-sacrifice and just keep my mouth shut essentially yeah. um, you know as I got older and got through my uh, teenage years and early 20s I, I you know I started to kind of, I knew that I wanted to have my own business I knew that I wanted to create great things in the world and I went about starting to, well, trying to achieve those from my early 20s when I started my first business as a personal trainer and then had a fitness business with Fitness for Mum. And um, <clears throat> I didn't realize at the time, but for uh, the vast majority, well, the early years of my life, the first 28, to, you know, 28 years of my life, I just didn't realize that I, I didn't feel good enough and didn't feel worthy of having what I wanted to create. And how that showed up in my business was that I would constantly undercharge my services. I would take on problem clients. I would um, be constantly putting out fires with customers, with my team, with myself. I was very much focused on in, um, uh, investing in the external, you know, all the marketing, the sales, all those kind of things. And no matter what I did, no matter how hard I worked, I very much believed that, you know, if I was just to work hard and push through and persevere and grind it out, that ultimately I'd get there. And to be honest, all that did, Mike, was get me a whole, leap, a whole heap of shit, to be honest. Mm. A whole heap of stress, struggle and sacrifice, essentially. Um, and I became aware of, a few things happened, I became aware of, of how I was operating and why I was operating in that way in my late, well, early 30s, really, 29, 30, and then set about the, the process of shifting that. And it's been a, a continual journey ever since, a journey of evolution, a journey that I'm still on. Um, I'm now 32, and obviously we started The Powerful Man three years ago now. So, yeah, it's been a, a fun ride. Right, so how... How did you decide to start out as a PT? So the, in terms of the, the finding it hard to express yourself when you were younger and, and walking on eggshells and, and all, all that kind of thing, how did that translate into deciding to start a PT business? Um, to be honest, you know, the whole walking on eggshells and not knowing how to express myself, although I felt a lot of that when I was younger, in my teenage years, um, it it wasn't really as much of a problem. You know, I was, I, I did well with the girls, that kind of thing. Cause you know, I kind of put myself worth and been able to pull them if I'm honest. Um, and <laughs> yeah, it wasn't, it, it wasn't really 
that much of a of an issue. It only became a real issue for me when I when I went to go and be someone and do something and have something more than I'd ever had before. So when I went into personal training, and I finished university when I was about twenty one, got a, a job for a year or so in a call centre, you know, just to earn some quick cash, pass some time, figure some things out, um, and then I went into personal training. And I just, my, in actual fact, my dad got me the interview at the gym. I had to, so I did some work experience there with them uh, when I was in university. So I had some kind of contacts there. My dad got me an interview and I just liked the place. I'd just finished my sports science degree too. Um, and I liked the idea of becoming a PT. I'd seen them a lot about the gym. And I heard, like I said, when I was on work experience there, they just seemed to have a really good life, you know, in charge of their own diary um you know their own boss it's their own business i was like yeah wow this pretty sweet deal so it felt right and i just went with it all right so it was very much more of a a transition from the education into starting the business what was what was the initial business like i mean did it meet your expectations did it did it fall down in certain ways? Was it better in other ways? I mean, sort of paint the picture for us in terms of what it was like starting out as a personal trainer. Um, it was exciting, you know. I really enjoyed it. You know, it was, it was, a, re- it was a great time of my life because um, at first when I started at Virgin, I was working on the gym floor. So it started as an actual job. Um, and the reason why I took that route was because Virgin would pay to put you through your PT qualification. So... Not only would I gain experience from being around the PTs and the gym floor, get to know the clients and well, get to know the members. And this was like, this is the the club in Leeds, which is actually the the, uh, busiest in the UK. So massive footfall, massive membership base. I really got to know a lot of people, learn my trade well, learn my craft, turn some skills whilst they were putting me me through my PT course. And then as soon as I qualified, um, that's when I became, that's when I went into actually being a personal trainer with them. And it was, do you know what? It was a really soft transition, if I'm honest. Um, they eased me in really well. So it was like I'd drop a, a couple of days on the gym floor, then I'd, I'd fill those with PT. And it kind of went like that until the point where they said, right, okay, you're done now with the gym floor. You're full-time personal trainer. I think that was a little bit scary at first, but by that point, I'd already got a client base and whatnot. But, you know, the the thing with it is, uh, despite being paid through Virgin and working in a gym, you still didn't have a base salary as a PT. So I still, obviously, it was still my own business, still re- uh, relying on myself and all the rest of it. Um, and I really, really loved it. I really enjoyed the freedom. I really, really enjoyed the freedom. And it was pretty quickly after that that I started Fitness for Mum because I was obviously doing PT on the gym floor. And I saw, um, I saw there were a lot of pregnant women coming into the gym. And there was nothing there for them. You know, they'd go on the cross trainer, they would do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but nothing any ever really effective. Um, and then when they gave birth, they'd either leave the gym um, or they'd struggle to get back into shape because, of they, again, they just didn't know what to do. There was nothing really there for them. And I went on a course with Virgin at the same time as well, and somebody said to me, you know, no, if you want to specialise in something, nobody's really specialised in, uh, pre and postnatal fitness and I was like huh interesting so I looked into it looked online there wasn't really anything online there wasn't really one resource online that was that was a one stop shop for women to go to and actually you know find a lot of information and um, just be able to exercise safely and effectively so that's when we did, I started fitness for mum so I grew fitness for mum alongside the personal training business for um I started that when I was 24, so it must have been four, three or four years before I then went full-time on, on Fitness for Mum. It was at, when I was growing Fitness for Mum, that's when all these earlier instances of, you know, walking on eggshells and not feeling good enough, not knowing how to express myself, that's when all those started to come out. And that's when I was, you know, starting to, to go and be, do and have something more than I'd ever had before. You know, I was breaking through my old comfort zone. Um, and that's when they were coming up for me. Right. So so looking back then, what what do you know of the reason why? So when you mentioned the, the, the PT business, although you had these sorts of things come up, 
the, the transition was quite smooth, as you said. You know, you already had the clients and things, but there was still an element of of that almost like afraid to do it. Maybe I mean, you could, you know, correct me if I'm wrong on that. But then you've got this idea of starting fit for more, and you, you mentioned that it maybe came up stronger. I mean, what was the the difference between those two things? Um, to be honest, there wasn't really a great deal of, of fear going on when it was when I was personal training. You know, I was still living at home with my parents. Um, I was quite young, so you know, the, the 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 there wasn't really many risks involved. If I'm honest, um, the the main fears started to come up when I was. Do you know what? Actually, Mike, because I'm, as I'm thinking back to this, I didn't, I didn't even know they were present for a long time in my life. Um, and this is mm. the thing, you know, I was growing fitness for mum, and I just, I was still buying into that mentality of, you know, if I just work harder, then I'll be able to achieve. If I just persevere, then I'll all work hard. If I just push, 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 then you know something good will come of it. It's got to. I was buying into that whole hustle hard mentality, and. What happened was I got introduced to um, I got introduced to a good friend, and he was working his business online. He was working it from anywhere in the world, generating more money, impacting more people, traveling the world. It's like fuck, it's like wow, <laughs> this is this is the real life evidence of everything I've been reading online, everything I've been researching, everything I've been looking at. This is a real life example of it. Why am I not living that way right now? No, because mm. until that point, it was a little bit of a pipe dream. It was a little bit like, huh, I'd love to be able to do that, but I don't really know that it's possible. You know, I don't really know anybody <laughs> that's doing it. Whereas yeah, when definitely. I met this guy, yeah, well, when I met this guy, I was like, fuck, shit. <laughs> but it really got me to start reflecting on the, the, the pattern of my life and what was going on. And that's when I started to, I just, I, I, I like took a step back. It was almost like looking at, things from a bird's eye view and I could just see this this thread of chaos throughout all areas of my life. In my relationship, I was in a relationship that was very, very toxic. It'd been that way for many years and I was afraid to leave it. You know, so what did I do? I then proposed to the woman. I we bought a house, we got engaged, we booked the wedding. All when it didn't feel right. None of it felt right. I'd been, I'd just been involved in some bad business deals and got robbed of tens of thousands of pounds. Um, all when it didn't feel right. And I, I ignored my gut instincts and I did it. I just went ahead with it out of neediness and desperation. My business. So like I said, I was taking on problem clients. I wasn't working it in a way that I wanted to work it because I was just, I was just needy and desperate again. And I really started to get, it really started to become aware to me that I was, Every every decision I was making, I was ignoring my gut instinct. I was ignoring what was really true for me and what, what I really ought to be doing because it scared me to do those things. It was easier in the moment to take those actions to play small and stay in my comfort zone despite the, the chaos it was causing in my life. And I really started to do some work to understand where this came from. You know, why was I so afraid to follow my gut instincts. Why, why was I so afraid of being me? And that's when I started to, to realize, fuck, all these patterns. You know, this has been going on my entire life. You know, I, re I, start, I realized that it started when I was about seven years old. You know, I didn't have, the, like I said at, at the start of the show, you know, the, pot, the uh, relationship I had with my father was one which was very much authoritar authoritarian. I didn't see him a great deal and, he worked, he worked hard, he worked late, he worked away a lot. And, you know, I, I, I didn't really get to spend much time with him. So on a weekend, we used to go up to the local field and, and practice football. And, you know, one day I, I scored, I was playing in a primary school football match. I scored four goals. And I was like, fuck, yeah, I can't wait to get home. And so get in. Dad, yeah, this is my moment. He's going to be so proud of me. So, you know, I rushed home, waited for him to get in and, I was quite nervous about sharing this as well because I was like, this was my moment. You know, up until this point, I just, like I said before, I'd been walking on eggshells. I didn't feel like I could be me. I just felt lost, if you like. I just didn't feel like my voice mattered. So, you know, this moment was a huge moment for me. And anyway, my dad finally arrives home from work. 
uh, walks to the door, goes upstairs, gets a shower, comes down, uh, grabs a beer, and then sits in his chair. You know, all dads have a chair, don't they? He sits in his chair. <laughs> yeah. And um, he turns the TV on. And I go to stand in front of him to tell him about these goals. And he just he just does a hand gesture to, to just brush me to one side. And I just remember this massive sinking feeling. This feeling of just like, oh. And I was about seven years old, so I, I didn't understand it. I didn't have the tools or the awareness to understand what decision I was making in that moment. But ultimately, the decision I made in that moment that was that, you know, I'm not good enough, that I'm not worthy, that I don't matter. And then I looked for ways my entire life to then prove that right. You know, my sister, who's seven years older than me, uh, she went traveling when she was 18, I was 11. I then believed that that was because she didn't want to be around me. I then, you know, got girlfriends and I cheated on them because I put myself worth on being able to, you know, pull the girl that all the boys wanted. I then took too many drugs. I was people pleasing. I was, you know, sedating with alcohol, with drugs, partying, all that kind of stuff. And it all culminated, it all got to the point when I was about 23, 24, got into this relationship and just tolerated and tolerated. And it was abusive. It was an abusive relationship. And I just tolerated it because I was just afraid to to leave it. And, you know, that eventually got to when I was 28 and I met this guy. And when I looked back, that's when I became aware of this big thread. And I was just mm. like, wow, 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 wow. You know, the guy that I was being, you know, I was trying to achieve these great things in my life and in the world. And it was no wonder that I was struggling to make progress because I was just so out of alignment, so out of alignment. Yeah, I, I can definitely see how, how just that one moment of, of awareness, you know, where it's all, it's all there in front of you to see it, you know, so sometimes we don't see it until we have that moment where we do look back and we do have that moment of, of having the bird's eye view where we actually see it all in front of us and then we just realise, don't we, that it all stemmed from that, that one incident, you know, when yours was that time we did die with the football goals. I mean, what what did it take for you to actually have that level of awareness then? Was there a process? Did you ask yourself particular questions? Try and be as, as specific as you can, Tim, if that's all right, because obviously people want, they might want the process that you had to to become more aware and to understand that it was all laid out in front of them they just had to see it you know so mm-hmm. but what was that process like for you um the first the first step for me was obviously meeting that meeting my friend and being like fuck you know just accepting you know fuck you know this isn't yeah. working what i'm doing isn't working and just being real with myself and accepting that rather than getting caught up in busyness and chaos and do, 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 do. So taking that moment to pause and stop and just accept. And then the second step was to just really, there wasn't so much of a process involved because, well, I say a process. What I basically started to do at that moment in time was um, get real as well. You know, so I accepted that it wasn't working. And then I got real with myself about where I was lying to myself because, Mm. you know, like I said, even when I did the business deals, when I proposed, when I bought the house, uh, when I was taking the drugs, when I, you know, all those things, all those instances, you know, cheating on the girls, none of it felt right. None of it felt right. And in every step of the way, I ignored my gut instinct. So over the years, this ignorance was bubbling and building and bubbling and building. And it was just becoming more and more and more apparent. And it got to the point in my life whereby I could no longer ignore it. So once I took a moment to pause and stop and accept that things weren't working, I was in, the next step was to obviously understand why. And it was pretty clear to me that, you know, well, everything you do, everything you've done so far, you've done despite not feeling like the right thing for you to do, you know? Um, Mm. And then from there, it was a a process of, well, you know, where, you know, what's going on for me? Where, where does this come from? Where could it come from? And that was more of a, you know, that wasn't kind of like an epiphany. That was something that 
I, I, I sat with and I was just patient with over days and I really allowed it to, to, to ruminate because I, I really looked at the, 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 the pattern that I'd been running, you know, obviously ignoring my gut instinct, but then why, 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 why? And the most prevalent one at that moment in time was a relationship because, you know, my parents were about to put £10,000 down on the wedding. I knew that it didn't feel right. I just knew that it was going to end in divorce. I just couldn't let them do it. So that's when I cancelled the wedding. I ended the relationship and I got rid of the, 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 the business partner at the time. I got rid of the fitness franchise. I just started to do everything my way for the first time ever. And my way was just following my feeling based on what felt right. It was as simple as that. It was learning to get in tune with my gut instinct. Well, I'd, I'd always been in tune with it because I was ignoring it, but just learning to honor it, you know, just learning to that it's okay. And the more I did that, the more I took that action, the more amazing things started to unfold um, over time, bit by bit, bit by bit. Yeah. Well, what do you think is the, the difference between someone that, that maybe maybe has these, these feelings but ignores them and then has these feelings and, and takes action on them? What, what would you say that the difference was between those people? I mean, you can relate it to guys if you want. You can be specific to the people that, that you work with if you want to, Tim. But uh, what, what would your answer be to that? Standards. It'd be standards. The, the, the guy that listens to his instinct and honours it and takes action then makes decisions in the world that might upset other people. He makes decisions mm. in the world that aren't going to please everybody because he's so focused on pleasing himself. He's so focused on doing what feels right for him in that moment, you know, and that comes from self-love. That comes from honoring your standard. That's the biggest act of self-love you can give yourself is the permission to just be you, the permission to make a decision based on what you want, what is true for you. Whereas the guy that has that feeling and doesn't do it, the only reason why he doesn't do it is because he fears rejection. Even if he feels fa fears failure, it's not that he fears failure, it's, it's what the failure would mean to him. In ah, his okay. mind, the failure would mean to him that he would lose love. The failure to him would that he would be shown up, he would be rejected. So as a result, the guy that wants to ignore his gut instinct and you know doesn't want to show up in the world and doesn't want to experience failure or just wants to people please and be liked and be accepted and get by, the difference there is that he isn't honoring his standards. Mm. He isn't aligned in his self-love. And as a result, is more than likely not getting the result that he wants. Even if he's making money, it's easy to make money. We can all make money. It's whether you make money that matters, whether you make money that matters to you, money that fills you up, money that's aligned to your purpose, money that creates impact in the world. You know, and that guy that is ignoring his gut instinct, there's no way that he's going to be, even if he's making money, there's no way that he'll be feeling happy and fulfilled and proud of his results. It's not possible. Right, so it, it, it seems, it seems like, it's almost like uh, the old thing where it isn't about making money, it's about how you make the money, you know, because you can make all the money in the world, but if you're not, if you're not proud of like how you make it, then, then there's, there's obviously there's something going on because there are people out there that that might make it in a way that they're embarrassed by, and then there are people out there people out there that are more than happy to to actually share it and to to be really really pleased with the work that they're doing. And I think it does come back to doing things that that, that feels right to you. But then, just me being a little bit of a, a devil's advocate now, Tim. It sounds it sounds quite it sounds quite a bit like I mean, that I know there are going to be people listening to this that are going to be in a position whereby, well, that, that sounds a bit like being a little bit selfish. And it sounds a little bit like being a little bit self-centered. Now, obviously, I know certain things where that wouldn't be the case. 
because you know I'm, I'm a little bit di- different compared to most people i have my own views on this but what what would your thoughts be on that so just so i'm just so i'm clear you're saying that if you make you know sell, the, the question is you know people would that would be making money the well enjoying the way in which they make money that is, is that selfish is, is that the question yeah, it's, it's kind of like doing things that feels right to you and doing things that are, are best for you that might not be in, in other people's best interest, might come across as selfish to some people. What, what, what would you say to that? Awesome point. And um, I'd agree. So here's, here's a question for you, Mike. So, you know, for people to get the most from you, so for you to be the best father the best son, the best husband, the best entrepreneur, for all those people in your life to get the best of you, do you think that you need to get the best of you first? I definitely think that in order to to put yourself in, in the best position to help others, you you need to feel like you have enough to give those people. So if you're struggling, if you're always, you know, you could be stressed out, you could be overwhelmed, you could be all over the place. It's very hard to do the best for other people when you're in that space. And it'd be my, it'd be my opinion that you've got to actually meet yourself. Well, the the, the, the idea is, is you can't serve people from an empty cup, right? You need to fill, Mm. fill your own cup first. So my, my opinion would be, you've got to do both. So you've got to do things that are just for you, like fill your own cup up. And you've got to do things that might be for other people. But then the, the kind of optimum way I would do it is the things that serve you also serve others, which is why we benefit from being around like-minded people. So if we're around like-minded people that are similar to us, helping us automatically helps them at the same time. Yeah, I love it. And I totally agree. You know, I, in my opinion, it's about being selfish so you can be selfless. Um, you know, it, it, I'm really big on you, me, anybody not having to experience any self-sacrifice in their life. You know, so when we talk about being selfish and putting other people's needs first, you know, if you're, let's talk about a relationship, for example, if you're in a relationship with somebody and you are not wanting to do something for them. So let's just say you could then be called selfish because you're not wanting to do something for them and you're putting your needs first. Then if that was, if that was one of the men that we worked with, then the response that I would give them is, okay, well, cool. If you're experiencing that you don't want to do something for the other person, is it because they're making a request of you that's you know unreasonable? Is it because you don't have clear agreements in place in the relationship, so you're not clear on what you both need, so what her needs are and what your needs are, and you're not able to have them be met? Is it, you know What's going on there? Because in, in some respects, it, well, in all respects, you should never, ever feel like you are having to self-sacrifice. You never have to, you should never feel like you have to do things that you don't want to do because, you know, the more that you, the more that you are experiencing that kind of energy, the more that it affects all areas of your life, the more it breeds resentment. You know, whether it's you start bringing on board problem clients, whether it's you um, you start to undercharge for your services, whatever it is, because what you tolerate, you get more of. Um, so, yeah, I firmly believe in you, me, everybody putting ourselves first. And you put it so beautifully, you know, so that you can't pour from a cup. Well, what we say is you can't always, you can't pour from a cup that's always been emptied, which is not possible. You know, so you put your needs first so that you can ensure that your cup is full so that you're in a position to be able to give to others. And at the same time, whilst you're having your cup be full, it's also possible to make sure that your whole life is aligned to it being an absolute fuck yes. Because there's no way that you can impact the world at level that you know you're capable and deserving of impacting it and make the money you want and have the health you want and the sex and the happiness if 
you were leaking energy in other areas because you were settling and sacrificing and not honoring your own boundaries. Now, if you are in a relationship with somebody and they're continually asking you to do things, they're making a really genuine request of you. It's not unreasonable, you know, but you just don't want to do it. Then maybe that's the wrong relationship for you. Does it make that person wrong? Does it make you wrong? It just means that you don't want to meet that other person's needs. You feel like you are sacrificing in doing so. Whereas when you're with that person and you love them and you're on fire with them and you're co-creating amazing things in the world with them, when they make a request of you, you just naturally want to do it. So there's no sacrifice there. Yeah, I mean, but one of the... I've actually just had a, a recent conversation about it. That's why it's kind of top of mind you know you can have you can be doing the same things let's just say exactly the same things but you could be around different people and you know in, in the first group it might be amazing you know they might want to do it with you they'd be all excited they'll be like yeah let's go let's do it and then you could be with a different set of people that might actually resent the idea of you considering it so mm-hmm. it's so, so you saying before about you know, that you might be in the wrong relationship if you're in that position consistently. What what advice would you give? I mean, just, just leaving the relationship might be a bit too excessive for some people. I mean, that's that's the first thing that springs to my mind, you know? Mm. Like if, if someone wanted advice, they're probably thinking, well, I can't just leave the relationship because of X, mm. Y, and Z. I mean, what, what would your advice be on that? Well, you know, one of the one of the big things that we find with the men we work with, and you know, these are pretty high level men. You know, they're financially successful, six, seven. Some of them have been eight figures, create amazing impact in the world. And you'd be amazed to 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 hear that a lot of them actually don't know what they want. You know, when we ask them when they come into the program, you know, well, what do you want? A lot of them don't know. A lot of them have just got to the level that they've got to out of sheer hustle and force and pushing. And they've really been pushed by their pain, their need and the desire to prove that they're worthy and good enough and to gain significance through money. So let's say the relationship, like what, you, what we're talking about, if they are, if, if one of our guys was experiencing this in the relationship, then usually where that comes from is the, there's no real agreements in place in the relationship. When the guys come, when, when we work with the guys, we give them um, eight compass questions that they complete and the partner completes. And those questions are things like, um, you know, what do I want my relationship experience to look like? What has to happen in a relationship for me to feel loved, special and important? Um, what do I love about the other person? What are the top 10 things that make me feel happy? You know, there's, I can't remember them all, but there's eight questions. And the point is that once you, once you answer these questions, and your partner does the same, and you both read them out to one another, and you're super clear on what where each other is at in that moment. You then swap them, and mm. you know you then over the next thirty days, sixty days, whatever, it's super clear on what you get to do to you know meet the other person's needs. Now, in that moment, you have two choices. When you receive that piece of paper back from the other person, you can look at it and go, okay, cool, nice. You know, can I meet these needs? Yes or no. Second question, do I want to meet these needs? Yes or no. Because you just might you just you just might not feel like you're able to meet all of them. You just might not feel like that. Or you might feel like you are, but you just might feel like you don't want to. And if you don't want to, neither of these scenarios make anybody wrong or right or whatever. It's just great feedback for you to see, okay, cool, I've got a, a third choice. If I can't meet them, uh, or I and I don't want to meet them, well, I've got a choice. Or if I can't meet them, but I want to meet them, then I've got another choice. You know, so usually uh, what we have found from, you know, we've worked with hundreds of men, usually the common um, cause of a lot of the frustration that people feel, especially, well, in their entire life, is communication. Their ability to know what they want and then to ask for it. Um, it's, it's, it's such a simple, simple, simple concept, but it's one that, you know, in my experience, our generation has just become so detached from, so detached. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I definitely echo that. And it seems, it seems a lot like it's, it's almost like work that you would do beforehand to make, Mm -hmm 
everything else easier in the future. You know, like, exactly. um, and I guess your your point about your your moment of awareness before deciding to to do things that felt right to you was was that moment of okay, well, I've got to do some of the work beforehand before I then dis- decide on on what was next. So, what was next after that moment, and how how did you how did you get to the the point of okay, I'm going to help guys with X, Y, and Z? Talk us through that. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, how long do you have? <laughs> no. Um, so basically, what happened once I became aware of this? Um, I didn't. I went through a process. This was about August time. That well, I met my friend in August. Uh, the, I cancelled the wedding and everything in the September time, and then from September, then I moved back home with my parents. And then from September until about January. Um, I went through the process of just dismantling all these things, you know, restructuring uh, the fitness business, letting go of the business partner, getting rid of the office that we had, um, other bits and pieces. And then it got to Easter time of the following year. I'd been home about six months and um, I was in my room upstairs and I could hear my dad just talking shit to my mum downstairs. And this is something he'd done often. Often he used to he used to drink quite a lot as well. I wouldn't say he was an alcoholic by any means, but he, every night he'd be drinking. Anyway, this one night he came upstairs. My door was open. Obviously, I'd heard what was going on, and you know he said to me, "Make sure you take those fucking dogs out before you go to bed." And I'm like, "Do not speak to me like that." And he's like, "Make sure you take those fucking dogs out before you go to bed." He repeated himself. And I repeated myself. So the exchange started to get a bit heated. Um, I stood up in my doorway, he was stood in his doorway, and it finally uh, snapped with him saying, well, do you know what? If you don't like it, get your bags and leave. So I said, okay, fine. So I got my bags, went downstairs, sat with my mum, and uh, made sure she was okay, and then I left. And the following day, I was, I'd was i already prearranged to meet my uncle, my dad's eldest brother. And, you know, to everybody, my dad was amazing. It was, you know, he had it all together and all my friends loved him and all the family loved him. But in, the, in our family dynamic, he just didn't know how to express positive emotion because of what he'd been through as a, as a child and whatnot. So anyway, when I met my uncle, I just told him exactly what my dad was like. I told him, you know, how it was to me, to my mum, to my sister with his drinking. I got my sister on the phone. I had her confess everything. I got my mum on the phone. I had her confess everything. And I, then I dropped my uncle off at my dad's house and let him go and confront him with it all. Because this was my dad's eldest brother, someone who he respects highly. And um, at that point, you know, I just started to share my story through social media. And my friends thought were absolutely insane. They didn't have a clue why I was doing it, but it just felt right. I just started to share it. And guys started to respond to it. They started to they started to reach out to me. I started to have conversations with them and, and help them. I was just helping them. And um, shortly after that, a few other things happened with my father, another conversation that we had that was very powerful. Um, and shortly after that, I was, I was just sat there in uh, my girlfriend's mum's house. I'd, I'd created the space in fitness for mum because I've really felt the pull to get into coaching and speaking and authoring. I really felt the pull. I just didn't have a clue what it looked like. I didn't have a clue what it was going to be. I, I just committed to not forcing it. So I'd created the space in fitness from around this time when, you know, I had, I dropped my uncle off at my dad's house. So I was just allowing whatever it to look like to flow through. And I started to share through social media. I was working, I was starting to help some of the guys out. And um, like I said, I was sat there on the sofa at my girlfriend's mum's house. And I was looking at this statue of this really stacked guy. And he was holding this woman. It's like she was surrendering him to his arms. Mm. And I was just like, I, I don't know what it was, whether it was inspiration or what a voice, whatever it was. I don't know what it was, but I heard something say, you know, the powerful man can have it all. I'm like, huh. What the fuck's that? Like, what, what's a powerful man? Um, and I was looking at this guy and I was looking at him thinking, well, him right there, he's a powerful man. Like, he's got it. You know, the analogy of him having it all, like, 
who was really, in the traditional sense, really powerful, you know, muscular, strong, tough. And in the modern sense, he was really powerful too. You know, he was soft and he was vulnerable and he was, in, he, he was emotional with the woman there. And, you know, he's had a nice balance of the, of the feminine and the masculine. And I really started to play with the idea of, you know, the powerful man. And as I was working with these men and it just evolved into what it is today. And, you know, it was an, an amazing journey. We've um, done some amazing things, held events in the, in the Himalayas, in the French Alps, in, in the Austrian Alps. Today we've, we've helped over 200 men now through the activation method. And it's, uh, it's, it's really amazing. It's been, a, it's been an amazing journey over the past couple of years. It really has. Yeah, I'm sure it has. All right, so just, just before we, we get to the last couple of the questions, talk us through what the activation method is. So for someone that's never never even heard of it, so there could be people listening to this, Tim, that have no idea who you are and no idea of, of how you help us guys. So talk us through what the activation method is and how it actually benefits us. Awesome. Uh, yes, yeah, so the activation method is a system and a process that – uh, we teach men that really enables them to create success on their terms. You know, there's there's three steps to it, and you know, with the, when the men go through these steps, they're really be, they're really able to be set free with the truth. They then create with the creed, and they produce with the pillars. Because, like I said a moment ago, Mike, you know, a lot of guys, a lot of people just don't know what they want, and that's okay. You know, what isn't okay is pretending that you do know what you want and just pushing and forcing and grinding and hustling. Because, you know, once you accept that you don't know what you want, you reclaim your power, the ball's in your court, and you can then go and create what you want. And it's not just about making money. Yeah, sure, you might want to make more money, but why? What impact do you want to have? What do you want your relationship to look like? Your health, your happiness. You know, what that real success, success is more than just making money. Way more than making money. So the activation method is a system that, that, like I said, enables guys and teaches them how to create success on their terms. Sounds good. Yes, yeah, sounds sounds like you've got things quite um, streamlined as well. Like when you said there's, there's three three parts to it, I was I was hoping for this like big long list of like ten different things and there's this like twenty mm-hmm. step program and all that kind of thing. But you've you've clearly spent the time to to refine it and get it down to your kind of baseline three, if you will. I'm sure you go you go deep and I'm sure there's different parts to it, but you've managed to to streamline it into these into these three, which seems quite good. So are there any are there any resources that you'd recommend? So we're talking books, we're talking apps, we are talking different resources that you know of that, that, that we can use to benefit us. So, I mean, I think a book might be beneficial because obviously you could link it to, to the work that you do. But then in terms of like people that run their own businesses might be looking for something that maybe they've never heard of before in terms of running a business or improving that, that, that side of things. So talk us through some resources, Tim, that you'd recommend for our listeners. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll mention a few. In terms of books, I love the book Conversations with God. Um, mm-hmm. It's really about, you know, understanding who you are and your, and your power, essentially, um, and letting that flow. Um, in terms of apps, I think ThinkUp is a great app that you can record um, affirmations into. However, there is a caveat with this because, you know, one of the, the problems with affirmations is that if you don't actually feel the affirmation, then it creates more of a void in your life because you're continually saying something to yourself over and over every day, but not believing it, not really feeling it. So you're trying to convince yourself. You're, you're lying to yourself of it, essentially. And again, I'm not beating down anybody. I'm not saying nothing like that. Uh, I used to use affirmations a hell of a lot. Um, the point is I want this to be super effective for you. So um, ThinkUp is a great app, but what what is super powerful to do um, is combine it. We've got a guided meditation. Um, it's actually called a power activation. And what we do with the guys in the, the, one of the first steps, you know, setting them free with the truth, um, is all about, you know, detaching from all that they are not, so the man that they've been so far, remembering who they are and the power, um, and reinforcing that. So we 
take them through the, the power activation audio for them to get really clear and remember on who they are in their power. And from there, they then create the affirmations for the Think Up app. So they're really, you know, they're ingrained, they're, they're personal, they're really relevant, they really feel them, they're anchored in emotion, they're anchored in feeling. It's, it's super, super powerful. So in terms of resources, um, I've put some uh, bonuses together for your listeners, Mike. So if they ah, awesome. the show, if they want to head over to um, thepowerfulman.com forward slash bonus, they'll be able to get the power activation audio there along with the training. So um, yeah, and then combine the power activation audio with the Think Up app and yeah, that'd be a really cool resource. And use that at the start of the day, use it throughout the day, use it at the end of your day. You know, really, it's, it's something that's going to change your state. Uh, so whenever you feel like, you know, you want to change your state, it's there. All right, excellent. So, yeah, thanks for the, the bonus there, Tim. I'll put the um, the link in the description so people can can grab that. And as someone as someone that's actually read Conversations with God, I know there's going to be a lot of people going, huh, Conversations with God? It's very, very religious, isn't it? Now, as someone that isn't religious yet still has read all three of the books, explain to the listeners why they should read it and how and how it's not actually religious a religious context yeah great question um why should you read it because you know there's there's one destination and two paths isn't there you know there's there's one path that has you arrive at the destination beaten battered bruised and one that has you arrive there with a smile on your face you know enjoying the journey and the way in which you arrive there with a smile on your face enjoying the journey is really knowing who you are, knowing what you want, and being able to enjoy life as as it unfolds. So you, you're operating from a place of flow and ease versus a place of fear and lack. Um, so that book's going to really help you to shift into the flow and ease and away from the fear and lack. All right, cool. So yeah, thanks for the the app as well. And um, I'll definitely put the the bonus in in the description tim so we only have one last question we're almost finished and this is this is a little bit of a curveball compared to the questions that i've asked before um we've had answers ranging from fun silly all the way to sometimes quite serious it just depends on on, on how you you know interpret the question and uh, the question is what would you like the world to know about you that doesn't already know what would I like the world to know about me that they don't already know? Um, hmm. I'm a pretty, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm an open book. What do I want the world to know about me that they don't already know? <laughs> the only thing that's coming to mind, and I'm just going to go with it because I was right, is that I love peanut butter. That's as, yeah, that's, as, that's the only thing that's coming to mind. Uh, I feel like I'm a super open book. I don't really know what I have. I don't, I don't feel like I've got many stones left that are unturned. If if the guys are to Google me <laughs> or go look at other podcasts or hear my story, um, add me on Facebook, whatever, you'll see that, yeah, I don't pretend to be perfect. I'm far from that. That's a good thing for you to know that, well, you already know that. I was going to say that I'm not perfect. <laughs> not assuming that you thought I was. Fucking hell. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you know, we've had we've had chocolate cake, we've had we've now had peanut butter. So if if anyone's looking for some shopping lists and some yeah. key ingredients for happiness, then I think peanut butter and chocolate fudge cake are definitely on the list, Tim. Yeah, peanut butter, a bit of honey, put it on a on a rice cake, get a bit of banana on there. Mm. <laughs> nice. It's making me hungry. Just think about it, Tim. Yeah, me too. I'm on a juice fast right now as well. And I'm uh, oh. first day and I'm like, oh, need food. Food. <laughs> All right, Tim. Well, thanks for being a, a guest on the show. Really appreciate you carving out the time and um, I'm sure we'll speak again soon. Yeah, thanks, Mike. It's been a pleasure.